Hello, welcome to Marvelous or the Death of Cinema. We're back with uh, with another. We're back to the old grind with the the Marvel films here. Uh, it's Thor. And I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what's Thor. My ass after sitting through this boring goddamn movie. <laughs> and I'm Chris Hemsworth's bleached eyebrows. Um, yeah, coming off of our Paul Verhoeven like retrospective which was a complete indulgence for us early indulgence this was just it's an indulgence for everyone oof Oof. and i watched this like five days ago and i i had to bring up the wikipedia page before we started recording to refresh myself on what happened you just finished it as of yeah well as 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 usual i i put it off to the very last minute and i said i'll watch it this morning after breakfast and i just stared at the ceiling for three hours (laughs) <laughs> which was probably the better choice of your time oh it's a much more interesting ceiling uh than this is a movie um it's uh how did they get between hulk iron man 2 and this how did they get to avengers without this whole thing falling apart so that that's the thing i've been thinking about for the past few days is we had an okay movie iron man is entertaining enough the politics of it are completely noxious but then they released turd after turd after turd, three back-to-back turds and that's the foundation that this giant media empire and cultural behemoth has been built on and it's kind of insane it's like a dung beetle colony yeah that kevin feige pulled that off because yeah the hulk iron man 2 and thor just all back to back turds it's it's really incredible like this movie is so i mean i I think i liked it more when it came out i think i maybe liked it more than iron man 2 or hulk by a little bit because it's got like like like, i mean there's there's enough the, the, the cast is strong enough and chris hemsworth has enough charm maybe that it like felt like i was watching something a little bit less boring at when it first came out but that's like a, by a thin margin i remember it, i remember it being a lot more charming like i i still there were still a couple moments that got me a, a chuckle like the part where thor goes into the pet shop and demands a horse i thought that was funny and then he smashes a glass and that i remember that being funny but sadly that's not the entire movie yeah and this time i was just Again, this is I I liked this. Not well, I shouldn't say I like this because I didn't, but this I got less enjoyment out of this than I did The Incredible Hulk. That's that's my ranking. Well, one Hulk's a much better looking film. Uh it's cr- Oh, this movie looks like shit. This movie looks awful. Dutch angles all over the place. It's like ba- it's like what ba- it's like watching Battlefield Earth. It really is. It's it, 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 but like Battlefield Earth had like more effort in its sets and costumes. Like, the, like this is like the first like this was like the first Marvel movie that we've watched. That to me, like really, really looked like a Marvel movie where it's like everything's on a green yeah. screen except the New Mexico stuff. Uh, everything's on a green screen. There's just a lot of CGI, and it all looks like an Xbox 360 game. Um, <laughs> Like it really does. I'm not exaggerating. That was exactly I, yeah. the feeling I got. Like just too glossy and 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 um I don't want to say too artificial because artificiality can can be so great for it should we should be embraced in film in a lot of cases, but it's like too I I it's too digital is a bad way to describe it, but I feel like if I say that people might know what I'm getting at. Like too No, you're right. It is too digital. It's too like It's absolutely too digital. It's like did, do you know about FMV games? No. So FMV, full motion video, was the thing where like when when they started putting games on CDs, on like Sega CD, PlayStation, Philips, whatever, where they could have vi- like video clips in them, like live actors. Doing oh, stuff. Oh, okay. Now I know what you're and talking about. And they'd make about. Yeah. Whole, so they'd they'd make those whole games that were sort of like a Dragon Slayer, choose your own adventure thing that are all just video clips stitched together. And a lot of them were made that way. Or like games would use sequences like that in them, where it's just like 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 low rent, bottom of the barrel, sub direct VHS 
C movie actors in front of green screens um, on like super low quality, ultra compressed digital camcorder in the 90s. And these movies just look like an HD version of that. Mm. Like that same sense of like the actors and the way they're lit and the way they look being totally dislocated from the environment they're supposed to be in. Like a, like a, um, like a cut scene from Command and Conquer Red Alert or something. EA Games in the 90s did a lot of that. Yeah. You know what? That's That's a good place to start because something I've been also thinking about is theoretically what should a Thor movie look like? If if we were, because we're we're coming at this with the hindsight of Thor Ragnarok having already come out several years ago, that one is regarded as easily the best Thor movie. I I have not seen another. I have not seen another Thor movie I after this one. I haven't seen but, it in a while. Um, I saw the Dark World, the sequel, on a date, and I don't even remember anything about it. How was how was the date? The, I don't remember anything about that either. That was just a clearly that was a terrible date because I he took me to Thor: The Dark World. Oh, so a uh, boring, boring, boring guy, boring movie. Boring guy, boring movie. I I do remember Chris Evans had a little cameo. I think Loki so, showed up. So so when he so when he texted you the next day, it's like, hey, you want to go out again? You did not say another. No, I said uh, you put me to Odin sleep. <laughs> what is that? What is an Odin sleep? It's it's. I have been racking my brain over that for the past couple of days. It is a contrived plot device because, and I looked it up according to the synopsis, he's goes into Odin sleep in order to regenerate. So he's like Dr. Who, but why, he wasn't, but he wasn't injured or hurt or anything. No, and it's like, he's make, just, he's like, just, he's getting old. He's just he's, tired. Yeah. He's like emotionally drained because his sons are dickheads. And he needs to it's take like a just nap. Just has a heart attack out of nowhere. He's like, Ugh. it is. Well, it's one of those things where it's like it's it's supposed to be reflective of like the emotional dramatic thing. I guess it's supposed to be Shakespearean. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's, quote, I remember the which advertise. is not really isn't no no because no. <laughs> because Shakespeare generally had really compelling dialogue and interesting characters, and this movie is very Saturday morning cartoon. He just says. Odin just says to Thor, you are a cruel and arrogant boy and you need to learn and grow up and become a man. And then Thor says to Odin, you're old. And then Loki says, my brother's stupid and we can't trust him to be king. It's like, I'm not against, I'm not against characters in fiction saying what they think and feel because I say what I think and feel as a person. That doesn't seem unreasonable, but it's just like, it's like listing, it's like reading bullet points off of like your outline for the movie for like what each character's arc is going to be. It's it's really, really flat, really, really bad. Um, So I think my, my trajectory of thought there was uh, trying to nudge us to talk a little bit about sort of uh, – Pre like production information because you mentioned the sets and production design looking like shit. And guess who the production designer on this movie is? Who? Bo Welch, the guy behind Beetlejuice, Edward Scissorhands, but most importantly, the man who directed The Cat in the Hat starring Mike Myers. You know what? I mean, if nothing else, I'll say for that movie, it, it has an overabundance of production design. That's shock. Well, you know, here's like it I, all it all circles back, baby. You know what I'll say? Like, like this looking at this movie, it's like, okay, the concept art for this movie probably looked great. Oh, we probably the, the looked concept so art great. probably looked awesome. What a Thor movie should like when I and I'm not into Thor, I never really like we all know I was a Captain America kind of lady. But theoretically, when I think Thor, I think like Nordic heavy metal sort of illustration on the side of a van kind of shit. I something something or something really, really like kitschy. Well, that's and less not so serious. Like this I, I definitely associate Norse mythology with like like Scandinavian metal bands um but there is like the Thor comic I've seen bits and pieces of it like the early ones he was like the way he talked was in this like very like corny 
faux old English, whither thou thost my maiden kind of thing. So it's not he, he thinks, out of, yeah. necessarily out of place with the material, um, although they're really inconsistent with it. Like they, the characters, the Asgardians, the gods, they, they kind of slip back and forth between this elevated fancy speech and then talking like characters in a blockbuster movie who could just be from anywhere with their little quips and, and, and stuff. It's, it's, it, it's a very shoddy, lazy screenplay. And it, um, that's hilarious because the screenplay was written by three different people. Of course, um, it was. story or, provided by two. Um, if I can provide two a different, bit of yeah, it's background. J. Michael Straczynski, who's a <laughs> comics guy, and I think the guy who did that show Babylon Five in the nineties. Um, okay, I haven't heard of it. it. It was like it's like one of those shows where it's like it looks really cheesy, but like the people that loved it swear by it. But I've never seen it. I, okay. I can't judge it. Um, he's he's he seems really relative, well but it's like. Like, I can see, like, I guess I shouldn't say it's a lazy screenplay because it put a ton of effort to strip everything out of it. So it feels like a lazy screenplay <laughs> that probably started as a high effort one, maybe. But because, like, like, there's all these <laughs> plot elements that you could see working. It's just everything so um, flattened out. Well, I, I, the thing I've really been liking to do um, on this podcast is look into, like, production information to get an idea of okay who tried to make this a movie beforehand what could have that vision looked like so is it any surprise sam raimi was attached to make a thor movie in the 90s but it got stuck in development hell until the 2000s after which raimi completely abandoned the project um so eventually marvel studios starts Going again, he gave the project to Matthew Vaughn, the guy who directed or would go on to direct Kick-Ass and The Kingsman, which I think there's a new Kingsman movie coming out. I just know because I've seen trailers with Rasputin doing a dance. Uh, ra, ra, uh, Rasputin, the yeah. bear of the Russian queen. Um, and so with Matthew Vaughn as director, the story was going to be written by um, Mark Prosevich, uh, the guy... <laughs> The guy behind I Am Legend and Fasten Your Seatbelts, Kids, the Old Boy remake by Spike Lee. Uh, so well, I've never seen that. I'm, I'm sure that would have been good. I <laughs> No. That um, sounds like it would have been a better, like, I don't know if it would have been great, but it would have been better than this, probably. I don't know. But I, Vaughn was, I guess, his, his holding contract expired before production began. So the search for another director was um, done, and Mark will ultimately settled on Kenneth Br Brana. I have been practicing saying his name, Brana, because beforehand I was going to pronounce it Branag, and everyone was going to clown me. I can't do that, okay, guys? I know mispronunciation is my cute little endearing character trait on here, but I can't. I can't. This 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 director might this guy might actually win an Oscar this year because his his movie Belfast I guess about are you are you still so there apparently it's just getting nominated for a lot of shit yeah I'm I'm still hello oh yeah okay you're back okay <laughs> so so Kenneth uh, Kenny Branagh Kenneth made a Kenneth Branagh well he was so he was originally um, brought on mostly because they liked his Shakespearean shit. They yeah, thought that was a good angle. He made those '90s Shakespeare adaptations that I think did. He pretty made well, Edward. Right? He he makes Shakespeare movies, and from what I know about him, except for this new movie, which I have no interest in seeing, everything else he makes is shit. He did the Artemis Fowl movie, the greatly reviled Artemis. Oh, Fowl I did not see. Movie. I didn't even know they made one. I I read a couple of those books. Yeah, my sister was reading them. They're kind of laying around. They're okay. They're for what they um, were. But apparently also my boy Guillermo del Toro was attached to direct at one point, but he ended up stepping away in favor of directing The Hobbit, which he also ultimately jumped shit on, ship on as well. So I I don't know. I would have liked to have seen Guillermo del Toro's take on Thor. Uh, I, I, mean, I, I like I like his take on Blade. I, I think Blade 2 is better than I Blade haven't one. seen Blade 2 in so long. I remember liking it Blade a lot when I was a kid. Blade 2 rocks. I, re I did rewatch Blade 1 a little while ago, which is also a, a ton of fun. It's I, I, Oh, it's, I, it's I, super hammy. I love – oh, it is. But I, I love Wesley Snipes' Blade because he's, he's such a weird guy in those movies. Like he's – 
like a cool guy, but also like a guy acting like a cool guy. <laughs> it's mm, we're gonna have a new Blade movie too. Oh, I'm I'm kind of curious about that because that's their attempt to like make an yeah. R-rated Marvel movie. I'm I'm curious about how far they're willing to go. I guess speaking speaking of R ratings, um, in in my very very scant research into the production of this movie, and by research I mean just looking through the Wikipedia page, I zeroed in on this quote from uh, screenplay co writer Ashley Edward Miller, a guy by the way. And yeah. Ashley is is his name. Well, like like um, Ash from Evil Dead. Speaking of Sam Raimi, there are, there is male okay. Ashleys. It's a weird. It it is not unheard of. Um. Well, Ashley also wrote uh, Agent Cody Banks, starring Frankie Muniz, <laughs> with fellow co writer Zach Stentz, and that's the other big movie they had co written together. I guess before Thor. What <laughs> so a they were weird... completely qualified. What a weird assumption. I mean, this must be one of those things where it's, it's like so fucking wild. They're looking like I feel this. The, I, my guess is it's like they had they kept getting these screenplays that were probably more interesting, but more expensive or seemed less marketable, weren't broad enough, and they brought these guys in to give them something real generic. But but you gotta you gotta listen to what what a- Ashley Miller said about his screenplay. Oh before. yes, we got a quote. Yes. You want to feel Thor's rage when he rages. You want to see him fight like hell and take as much as he dishes out, maybe more. You want to have a visceral reaction to the guy and what happens to him. You don't want his adventures to be clean and antiseptic. You want to see the dirt and grime and blood. You want to feel every bone crunching moment of every fight. And when he unleashes the storm, you want to feel like you're seeing the power of a god at work. You want to come in Thor's ass. <laughs> None of that. This movie is no, absolutely it's, not it's, of that. It's so devoid of It is of antiseptic impact. as hell. I mean, there's a scene where Thor is covered in mud. Um, oh, he's fighting like a, a, a tall black guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He finds he's mud wrestling. He, he just... Well, it's one of those things they do in superhero movies where it's like you fight a bunch of mooks and they're ha- hapless, but then there's one bigger mook who for like 30 seconds puts up a good fight and then he goes down. Um, I, I don't know why. I always felt just, just, and then we've got Hawkeye in this movie and he just doesn't do anything. He, 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 he Because he claps. it's setting him up. This movie is purely just to set things up for the Avengers. It is filler <laughs> but he just he climbs into a little box that they lift up in yeah. a crane that they built just so hawkeye could stand it's in it so i guess so and he then he, shoot <laughs> he doesn't shoot any arrows he just aims it for oh, her. he doesn't and then his arm gets tired and he stops <laughs> like, well that was apparently he jeremy renner wasn't even credited for this like for for his first appearance as hawkeye did, did had her locker of, come funny. out her locker came up before yes. this, right? Okay, yes, yeah, that's weird. I'm pretty sure it had. Um, uh, another interesting thing: the uh, third co-writer on this movie is a man named Don Payne, who is best known for his work on The Simpsons and for writing the movie My Super Ex Girlfriend, which is a movie only I seem to remember. I remember. I I remember the ads for it because I remember she's um. It's Uma Thurman. Well, see, what I remember is she had like a shark and she was throwing it at a guy. Um, he also died of cancer in 2013. Oh, well. Um, Rest in peace. What John. episodes of The Simpsons did he write? That'll, that'll, uh, that'll, that'll, just, that'll allow me to uh, dial in my grief quantity gauge there. It's like, did he write some uh, bangers? I am not sure. You don't actually need to look that up. <laughs> I don't, I, no, I'm not sure, but. Uh, the only other thing of note is the uh, cinematography was done by Harris Zambarlokas. I all right, guys. I pronounced Brana's name correctly. Give me that at least. Um, and this guy also just did Belfast, which is a black and white movie. So the Oscars will probably throw in. Oh yeah, they're that, they're just way to that. Black and white. I th- I th- I feel like this movie is more of a Bell slow. Yeah, this this is well. N- okay, let's let's try to go. 
now let's let's try to dissect this movie sort of well i, th- I think I'm, I'm gonna bring myself back three days to sort of where it begins well i think we gotta it's... start with uh with um the fact that this is two movies crudely stitched together one is like um like if Macbeth was was a, a a a not good episode of Star Trek, and then one is E. T. But you but E. T. is a, is hot and you want to fuck him. Those are the two movies, um, and then they've and they sort of converge in the middle, or they sort of brush up against each other, and then at the end they they kind of just both flop into each other like um. When you mush play None together. of it works. No, no. None it's, of it, works it just kind together. of flails around. This, this is a movie that doesn't have any kind of narrative momentum. I remember even when I watched it when it came out, thinking like, oh, I found like like the, the fish out of water story could have worked. Uh, some of those jokes kind of worked. Um some of it works. Like I it's an angle. And what these movies need is an angle. Like the big problem with Hulk is it lost its angle halfway through. It became just a stupid romance. Like the angle could have been a globe trotting sort of adventure. And there you go. That's the angle. And, and this is another this, just. This movie's angle is fish out of water. And but also morality and high court drama. That's, yeah. That's why they bought Branna on is to give them that credibility. Like you're going to take the Odin Loki. And I mean, like that stuff could have worked too like the elements are all there if it was just not so flat in the writing and if it wasn't so truncated so they could fit fuckable et in the movie too like just (laughs) you can make one of these movies or the other and you could in theory hypothetically assuming you don't have a bunch of executives stripping everything interesting out you could in theory make either of those movies work but you can't do them both on top of them being marvel movies because this this really is like the hulk was really flawed. It just felt like a super, it felt like a yeah. generic superhero movie, but it looked and felt like a movie. Mostly Iron Man one did Iron Man two still, I mean, it was, it was still had a lot of sets, but this is the first one. It was really just like everyone's on a green screen and, and everything feels just like my eyes are sliding off of it. And this is, this is before the Disney acquisition too. This was released by Paramount. No, I know. Paramount, Paramount released this, and they also released Captain America. So this is before. No, that's not. This is before, that's not quite right. What? Um, Dis- Wait, Disney bought it? them right after Iron Man was a hit, like right at the end. But of it was still re- it was still but released Par- by Paramount. Paramount had the distribution rights. They they, yeah. they had to let that contract play out. But Disney was still running things behind the scenes from like oh. 2010 forward. Um. So that's a me- Ooh, like that's why Iron Man two is I see like whatever little bit of edge or texture Iron Man one has gets sanded out in two. Uh, uh, that that's because D- Disney took over. Okay, all right. Now con- connecting the dots, I am. Um, but this, anyways, this movie opens like fucking Twister, <laughs> which is just a, a really confused tone. Like we open with. Uh, Jane Foster and Dr. Eric uh, Sayrig, who's uh, Natalie Portman, just just before winning an Oscar for Black Swan, I think later in 2011, I believe, I think. Uh, but and then we got uh, 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 which scar? Stellan Skarsgård. He's uh, he's uh, Baron Harkon in the new Dune movie. Uh, like fat man. A real, you know, you know, here's the thing. I like there's there's not enough like real Norse casting in this. Like Chris Hemsworth is Australian. No. Like it's he's the only he's the only actual Scandinavian actor in this movie. And I think that's, right. that's a problem. I You're think right. I think it needs to be called out. The lack of, of real Scandinavian representation in this film. You know, I haven't been. We're, we're I haven't, going to send a petition to Disney. I haven't been this offended since I watched Highlander, and they had a Belgian play a Scotsman and a Scotsman play an Egyptian playing a Spaniard. That's real, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Not. Oh, I need to watch Highlander. <laughs> Highlander rules. And, and uh, rounding out our sort of human cast, we also have uh, Darcy Lewis, who is played by. Uh, what we just learned, NFT shell, Cat Dennings. Crypto thought 
Kat Dennings. Um, Which is very sad because I, I think she's very pretty and I, I quite like her in a couple indie movies I've seen. But on this rewatch, Darcy Lewis is doing nothing but just like whining about her iPod and how she's a political science major and they just give her terrible weed and dialogue. Yeah, they're... she's she's annoying. She's annoying. And I, I feel bad because she's very pretty. And up until like 15 minutes ago, I was like, I like Kat Dennings. And now... She's showing out for NFT. She's so, she's supposed no. to be yeah. She's supposed to be like the comic relief, and I get like what they're aiming for, and she's doing her best with what she's got. They just they don't give her good jokes or good responses. No, to no, things. she's just commenting on shit like it's Family Guy or something. Um, and the other thing I need to bring up because this has also become an obsession of mine. So Jane Foster in the original comics is a nurse, and I guess they. They were originally going to go with keeping Jane Foster as a nurse in the movie. And at some point during pre-production, they brought on a couple astrophysicists as creative consultants to get an idea of how to make the world of Asgard and Asgard. the real world. <laughs> As- yeah, Asgard. <laughs> the real world fit together to try to mesh some actual scientific jargon and theories into that world hence oh, so, like the, so that's the stupid rainbow bridge Einstein Rosen the, bridge yes so and during that point in development they were like why don't we just update Jane Foster's profession from nurse to astrophysicist so she's like a master astrophysicist and yet she is dressed like a fucking middle schooler she is wearing this shirt it's like a cartoon sun and cloud and it, it looks like the Avi for the uh, Twitter account baby's names. <laughs> and it was so distracting. It, and uh, she is a master physicist. I don't think she should be dressing in like TJ Maxx junior section fits. Well, they're, they're going for like, it, like an adorkable, I fucking love science nerd girl thing. And, and Natalie Portman does not give... Adorkable. She's not adorkable. No, no, she's not. She's just, she's, she's very chic. She's much more. She's like the. She's the face of one of the Dior perfumes. She's well. You know, what you do is you is you make Cat Dennings that. I mean, maybe she's a, a smidge young, but you make her that character. She'd probably play that. She character would better. have a lot more sort of personality. Yeah. To her too, but but she's she's yeah, such no, a whole, she's such a nothing in this movie. Her girls her, in her. girls in science. Girls in science. That's that's why. Girls in science. More women in STEM. We need more women in STEM because Marvel. No, I I, I know someone who is like, oh, I've I've I know multiple like women in science, and they've they're none of them are that uninteresting or or that lacking in like style yeah. or sensibility like the ones that are like so committed to their like they're like kind of like einstein level autism don't care about what they wear they are way less cute than that they're not wearing makeup they're just like totally utilitarian um yeah i don't know this the, the natalie portman this movie is just there's nothing there and there's nothing and to I, her I romance think she's with a great Christopher. actress I, I mean, she's I fine. She's, she's just got like the script, the directions, just not. There's, yeah. She's not working in this movie. I'm not. I'm not trying to blame her. I just mean her character is just nothing. Her her motivation is like she loves science so much. She'll do anything for her science. And then she has like one conversation with Chris Hemsworth, and then she's in love with him, and that's it. It's so unfleshed out. But even though it's supposed to be the like emotional hinge point of the movie. The, the end, oh, Thor smashes the rainbow road and all the Mario Kart racers fall off. And now he can't <laughs> go back to Earth uh, for a while, at least. And it's, oh, he's separated from his love. And you just, it's like, there's there's nothing. It's so thin. There's they nothing just, there. They just talked about the nine realms over a campfire together. Although I will say, I think Chris Hem- Hemsworth and Natalie Portman have a little bit more chemistry than Edward Norton and Liv Tyler. Oh, just a Dude, little, like, a little tiny a smidge, bit, but not a lot. Like, I think Chris Hemsworth smidge. is like reasonably, like he's fairly charismatic. Oh, he's, he's he's good as Thor. I like him. And would you believe he almost didn't get cast as Thor? He was initially rejected, like early in the casting process, and some some guy reconvinced Kevin Feige 
I think to reconsider Chris Hemsworth and he finally did like a screen test and everyone was like, you got the part. And then they decided to dye his, uh, to bleach his eyebrows, excuse me, <laughs> which looks terrible. It does look weird. Horrible. He's like too blonde. They did not. That's that's another another aspect of these Thor movies that's interesting is like, there's no like, I I've seen all three of them and there is no real consistency to them, like, Thor looks and, like, the world... I don't know. Like, three is the big departure. But here, the Thor looks so unfinished and it's, unpolished. It, it's like it's like a rough draft. Well, oh, yeah, they of, don't they don't know what to do with it. They don't it. know who he is. And, yeah, and, they, like, his character is pretty... Like, like the whole reason Thor keeps coming back is because they've got... They've got something in Chris Hemsworth. They've got something in Tom Hiddleston as Loki. As as actors, Tom Hiddleston as Loki is the um, and they were Kevin Feige was being like, okay, this Hemsworth dude needed some convincing, but his his washboard abs and Aust- Aussie smile is gonna bag the female demographic. And his cum can and, and it was Tom Hiddleston who ed- ends up stealing the fucking show and panties of every girl on Tumblr from like. 2011 till maybe 2017 it is, I, it is kind of it is one of those things i find it was a cult kind of fascinating is you've got the the like conventionally hot cut blonde muscle man and you've got this like pasty angsty <laughs> emo looking british guy. guy it's because he's british and skinny british guy who kind of looks like like he might be feeling a little under the weather. That's all they need. That's all they you need. You know, I, I I'm not judging because I with like women that look like that work for me. Like the the female version of that, like just kind of brooding and like slightly on the verge of death. Like I get it. I get it. <laughs> um, uh, we also need to mention that Odin is played by Anthony Hopkins, and after the opening scene where. Jane Foster accidentally drives her truck into Thor because Thor is being, it starts in media res. So Thor is being sent down to earth by Odin because he was a bad, bad boy and tried to do an invasion without daddy's approval. Uh, Odin is played by Sir Anthony Hopkins, uh, the goat himself, two time Oscar winner who also provides a bit of an opening narration for the backstory behind Asgard and the, Frost Giants War. So there's an opening narration that is just like the fucking Grinch movie. It's, it's, it's Again, so it all like, comes back to the Grinch and the cat in the hat on this podcast. That is my theory. It's it's so... We'll have to watch those at some point. They'll have to be a back-to-back yeah. uh, something. Not to watch something else, but some third category. I, I This really frustrating me because it's like, okay, if you're if you're going to give me like a big, crazy alien world with its own weird architecture and everything, like l- give me a little bit of mystery, entice me a little bit, let me ease into it and, le- and let me enjoy it and open up to it. Instead, they just dump this, this exp- – and it's not like the, like the intro to Lord of the Rings where it's like it sets up some basic elements of the mythology, but it leaves things a little mysterious and it's, it's just – at pure exposition it's just and i mean this whole like the, the whole this half of the movie the the like thor's pussy posse are so underdeveloped <laughs> they're they're not characters the act the they're actors the they're actors who play people. them are all trying to act like they are you think they, i think they all thought like oh this is my big break i'm gonna be thor's sidekick well, this Sif is my launch stands out because she's a lady yeah, and they, that's, they, and that's, they that's, give that's Thor why. a little moment where, like, who told all the guys that a girl could could be a warrior? It was me. But then also, it's like that's a joke. But it's like they're it's like they they go out of their way. It's like this this alien society doesn't have to have girl bosses and patriarchy in the first place. You know? <laughs> no, it, it's yeah. No, the well, there's there's a great thing we can talk about right there is just the fact that Asgard. First of all, we never see, really see, the actual, like, life and citizens and whatever of Asgard. It's, yeah, it's We're mostly all just combined to abstracted. Odin. It's throne rooms Odin, and feast the, halls. Rene all the way Russo. Down. Yeah. It's, we don't, it, second, it is 
really just a conglomeration of things I've already seen before, visually speaking. Like, it it really just looks like something taken straight out of the Lord of the Rings movie. Yeah, yeah. It do, it has no visual Every, distinction. Everything it even kind of looks like Wakanda. There's okay. There's a little bit of like hints of of like I like I said. I feel like there's probably a lot of really great concept art for this movie, and then a lot got lost in translation and in oh, as it usually bad is. visual effects and and stuff. But like th- in terms of just like construction quality, like I, the sets look like a, like a, a not great episode of Star Trek, which is fine for like low like low budget sci fi is allowed to look low budget. This is like a hundred million. Yeah, it could be. It could be, especially if you've got like good artistic direction compensating for the resource. But this just, this is a hundred million dollar movie. There's no excuse for this. Like at this, this was the same year that Game of Thrones came out, and Game of Thrones Game had of Thrones some actually, really great set design and and production. And, and Game of Thrones, like the first episode premiered probably within like a month or even weeks of this movie coming out. Oh, and now we got, oh, hey, we got both, they they suck both those, they, like, probably, like, the least compelling actors in the show, but, like, Rob and, um, uh, Kit Harrington and what's his name, uh, Mr. Hot Guys, they're they're both in this, they're in the Eternals, right, or something, they've both been sucked into the MCU now. With, with Kingo, my favorite character, Kingo. We'll, we'll get to that at some point, I'm, (laughs) I'm really looking forward to that. Boo. (laughs) Um... But another another thing that yeah, Asgard just has no personality. It's it's very me. it's just it's things I've seen before. Well, it's everything is gold and, and like so there's and little shiny. bits of neat it's like design, lime. but everything is gold and everything is very austere. And this is the way to it's like 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 Thor arrives. This is where it's like you really feel that like two different movies conflicting. Thor arrives on Earth. He, he he acts like a caveman at first, like an unfrozen caveman, just freaking out at everybody. And then he does like the barbarian thing, like he drinks a cup of coffee and he throws the mug down and says another, which is the the moment everybody remember the one thing everyone remembers from this movie. Yeah, and I, that's I like laugh. that's like Viking warrior rowdy guy stuff. But then everything in Asgard is so austere and high fil- high society. And we don't see him fancy do speech. any of those customs things. Yeah, nobody like uh, like Asgard doesn't feel like um of like a big Viking long haul with a bunch of warriors partying, which which is fine, which, which it doesn't necessarily have to. But that's like like Thor seems like that guy when he's on Earth. But that's not what they're actually like in Asgard for the most part. They 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 they, they everyone is like sipping their tea with their pinkies out in Asgard. It, it's like. Well, because this this movie is like it's from a story, a narrative perspective, it's just completely wrong. Like we get that early, that big early like, and by big I mean completely boring and forgettable, where Thor gets his his crew to go invade the frost giant planet because. He presumes that the Frost Giants attempted to assassinate his dad. Which I mean they um, did, but Which which they did, but as as Odin says later on, a wise king never seeks out war. He must be but he must be ready for it. And Thor's problem Sick Pickum Parabellum. His, yeah, his his Thor's problem is he is too eager to invade. He's too hot headed. He doesn't He's too cocky and pugilistic. Yeah, yeah. So he's, he goes, he's the he goes captain to of the football invade. team, and he 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 has too much hubris and not enough empathy. Yeah, for that's others. his. So so rather than spending perhaps time familiarizing us with what kind of world Asgard is, we need to see Thor in action because this is a Thor movie. He has hammer. I want to see him throw hammer it's, at. Yeah, it's stupid CGI monster. It's like they're 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 they compress and oversimplify the dramatic elements to get to the action, and the action isn't good. And then they go back to like faffing around on Earth and and just like it's got it's not all those movies like Iron Man two where the middle just kind of flops around and nothing happens. It's I don't under like I mean it's it's just a like if if you you could spend that time building up the characters and the relationships yeah. and their drama to make it more interesting. And then when you do get to the action scene, I might 
be invested in care. Uh, well, there's we're again. This is sort. It's the same problem with Tony Stark, where we can't show Tony Stark being a real fucking asshole. Otherwise, people might not like him. We can't show Thor being really, really cocky and a arguably bad guy. I mean, taken from a like. I'm I'm sure in the development of this movie, they were like, Thor's problem is that he is, you know, too, he wants, he's, he's too eager to invade other worlds. He's maybe perhaps a bit of a warmonger. He wants to rule through fear and taking action and just wants to be king for king's sake. But that is too asshole-ish. Like, as Loki, Loki says later on, he describes Thor as being... Arrogant, reckless, and dangerous. But and and Odin does, calls does, him does, cruel. Uh, yeah, but does does Thor's worldview actually change by being challenged by anything? No, Thor just learns some humility by having his powers taken away. And I mean, he, he a does giant become robot. he he does like That's do it. a lot of self sacrificing stuff at the end. But it's all just kind of it happens because the plot says it needs to happen. It's not well developed. Um, well, and it and and the stakes of it are completely like nothing because we know he's going to be able to find a way back to Earth because he's got to be in the Avengers. Yeah, yeah, it's like so, like that it, that breaking <laughs> of the Rainbow Bridge it doesn't have any sort of real emotional weight to it because we know it ultimately doesn't matter. Yeah, none. none he's whatsoever. going to see Th- Jane Foster anyway in a <laughs> sequel that I'm sure is going to be. Even more of a slog to get through than this. I don't know if she even shows up in the next two movies. I know that third one. She does. That next, next. She's oh, not she in the third movie. She's coming back for the fourth movie, which, and this is something I just learned too. I guess Jane Foster in the comics and they are adapting. This is the Taika Waititi one there. He's also directing. Jane Foster in the comics gets breast cancer. Jane Foster is going to be undergoing cancer treatment in this newest Thor movie that's coming out, directed by Taika Waititi, beloved director of What We Do in the Shadows and Thor Ragnarok. That, you know, that do you want to do you want to see Natalie Portman dying of cancer in your Marvel movie? I've, I should I've fucking actually, do. I've 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 actually I, I've seen people die of cancer. That's uh, that's not. Oh god, that's uh. It's fucked up. Marvel. And I, fe- and it's, I feel like like whenever they do that in a lot of movies or TV shows, it's a very sanitized depiction of it. It's just like you're just kind of bald and a little tired. It's uh sorry, yeah, I don't I don't want to yeah, I don't want to be a yeah. That's like such a weird I mean I, in comics you can kind of slow down and play those things out. But like in a Marvel movie where they're so like you're fitting into a movie, everything's so controlled, it's like I don't know how they're gonna make that work. That seems but that's that's yeah. that's why I'm kind of almost like I'm keen, I'm almost keen to catch up to the present because I feel like Marvel after the last Avengers movie, I get the sense that they're not they don't know what to do next and they're kind of throwing a lot of shit at the wall. They're kind of where D, like what DC's like kind of what DC's been doing like the whole time basically, which is just like yeah. I don't know what do we got treading what do we water got? What do we do <laughs> treading water desperately. Yeah. Oh, maybe this will work. Ah, no, we're sinking. Um. So I mean, like, I'm kind of curious to see what they do now that they're like trying to change the formula because they know it's getting stale. But I, and they're like their their core the 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 core elements that held it together up to this point are kind of you know the a- actors are leaving and stuff. They're definitely going to continue with Taika Waititi's version because I I will say I haven't seen Thor Ragnarok for a couple years, but I definitely would say in retrospect, like. It's it's definitely as a Thor movie, it is the best one. Like by by far, it has, and that's that's kind of the thing, especially with these Marvel movies, is they are probably at their best when they have some sort of artistic like personality, or like you can see sort of the overarching artistic vision coming from like, someone. Like, like, it is not there's, a board. Oh yeah, there's, it doesn't feel completely boardroom. No, it's it's like... And, but those are also the most frustrating because you can see where the movie butts up against the constraints of the boardroom and retreats yeah. constantly. Like I that, mean, was my, that was my problem with uh, Guardians of the Galaxy movies was you could see I them mean, creep up to that line <laughs> and then step yeah. back over and over and over again. And uh, they're better movies, but also like 
it, it, in a way, it's like the wasted potential is more frustrating than just seeing a mediocre movie. Oh, and we almost forgot uh, Idris Elba, Knuckles, our, our, our Knuckles, everybody. He's also in this movie. He takes up like one fourth of the poster and he has maybe like five minutes of screen time. He's he's the uh, the the guy who controls the rainbow bridge. He's Heimdall. Between, yeah, travel between worlds. And yet manages to be one of the more interesting characters, which low bar to clear, like manages to be one of the more interesting characters in the movie because he's like a weird honor code guy and he does weird honor code guy stuff to like sidestep yeah. his, to like loophole his own honor code to do what he thinks he's right. I always find that type of guy kind of interesting. Like it's not much, but it's something. Um, and um, <laughs> we, we also got to mention the other co-star of the movie, which is Dutch angles. This movie has a lot of fucking Dutch. Angles. Yeah. We, we like our Why? last, I don't know. Our last episode was entirely about films made by a Dutchman, and I don't know if he used any Dutch angles. No, they're first of all, none of Dutch angles have a very specific meaning to them in movies that are supposed to signify like just dis- being disoriented, like the story is you know unbalancing its stuff. Here, it's just. It's as if someone just knocked the camera a tilt. It's well, and it I, just keeps happening. Did I? I don't. It did I mention nothing. Battlefield Earth when before we started recording? Or yeah, while recording? I, I haven't seen. I haven't seen Battlefield Earth, but it's Battlefield Earth is it, all Dutch angles. And what I what I think it is, oof. what I think it is, is it's a director who's not comfortable with action. Yeah, trying Kenneth to Brenna, to be no. actiony and and trying to. Like I mean, this whole movie, like the action is is, is so, uh, blah. It's it's so sloppy, and I think it's because Kenneth Brown, uh, Kenneth Brown is not a he's not an action guy as far as I don't no. really know his filmography. But like I'm sure he did an- every like <laughs> non every non Shakespeare movie he's done has basically been like hot doo doo feces. <laughs> like it has been shit. So this. They they uh, they only chose Brana because he did the Shakespeare shit, and even then, this movie does not have a lot of Shakespeare shit in it. No, it's because like, the writing isn't nearly good enough, and wouldn't be allowed to be complex or sharp enough uh, to get anywhere close to that. Um, it's just why, but I think it's like a lot of when they bring in directors like this, it's like. They're 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 grasping ah, for artistic credibility, and, and and in the long run, it seems to have worked. Like I mean, people c- convince themselves before they go in that these movies are more than what they are all the time. Like all those think pieces and reviews and stuff. Like, um, and actually, that reminds me, like it's, like with these movies, I'm always trying to keep an eye towards like their larger, not just like oh, what's the political content of the movie, but what does it represent in terms of being. Be, being th- these movies being produced by marketing guys and stuff as they are, like what does that reflect about how marketing guys see the world and 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 what they think their audience is and what they want their audience to do? And I there's not a lot in this movie. There. Well, the only sort of political thing I could, other uh, than trust, well, let me go through. Trust your dad, King. He's always right. That's <laughs> yeah. Well, the only other thing I I picked up on. Is um around the when um Thor goes to the site where his his hammer has landed, which a bunch of the townsfolk have been going to and trading as like a sword which, and a stone. Which sort doesn't of thing. that was actually that was a fun little scene. All the rednecks trying to pull yeah. it out with their trucks. Yeah, that's that not cute. that's not bad. But his that's um, cute. Well, it, that Wilson, that hammer looks. I just want to say like not an impressive prop. Looks like just looks like solid cosplay work. It, yeah, oh, it's. I uh, I don't believe for a it. second that it's as heavy that it's a heavy okay. chunk of metal. M- Mjolnir. I also have that phonetically written down. Mjolnir in my notes. Mjolnir. 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 I, I I can't. I can't. It's that Atlantic. I it's that can't. Atlantic coast accent. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. Sorry. Uh. But anyways, Coulson after he's like detained Thor when he broke into the 
shield sort of uh, quarantine around the hammer. Coulson asks Thor whether he was trained in Pakistan, Chechnya, or Afghanistan. Presuming he's some kind of terrorist or mercenary. Well, he, so start, he starts. Once again, like, oh, he, as he starts, he says, "Are you a special forces guy who went X Y Z like places America goes?" And he's like, "Are you maybe a soldier of fortune, in South Africa, something, something?" Which is like, yeah. Once again, this and and this is something we need to really emphasize, and I don't think gets nearly talked about enough, especially considering Iron Man was the foundation cornerstone of the MCU. The MCU world is one that is defined by the war on terror in being post 9-11 because it is the explicit thing in Iron Man is that America has been doing some shit in the Middle East. So this week, I, it's. Yeah, it I, is. Here, it always need to have that sneaks through in. into these. I mean, Avengers, like that kind of like 9-11 imagery is all over Avengers in that big end sequence yeah oh yeah and everyone kind of comes together why well, does i just mean like but... the build like the way like the oh, dragon yeah. thing like knocks buildings down and the debris comes through the streets that's like all uh post 9 11 kind of conception of what that looks like like, you, like you'll get like independence day or something there's like there's there's a sharp difference between how they depicted a city getting blown up before and after 9 11 in in blockbuster movies yeah um yeah, so there's like these little things, and yeah, there's not. A, I mean, the thing that got me with the ice giants, and I, I see this a lot with these kind of movies, is because the good the, the good guys have to be good enough, and the bad guys have to be bad enough that you're like, well, you know, war is bad, and and we shouldn't just go and kill all the 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 frost giants, and we shouldn't just take it for granted that because a few of them snuck in and killed some guys that we need to make war on them. But then also the Frost Giants are all killers. The King of the Frost Giants is a liar and traitor and an assa- and going to assassinate Odin. And they are actually bad, but but also still you shouldn't genocide them. At the, which I mean, yes, you shouldn't. But yeah. like, it's like they they're, they're like, well, in the abstract, we can't. You, it's bad to kill a whole race of people, and that lets us set up easy stakes to make Loki worse than Thor. But then at the same time, it's like, well, the Frost Giants are all evil in this. Yeah, basically. it has. They're the villain of this movie is actually Loki. Like, yeah. It has to, for people who are not familiar with the fact that Loki is Thor's main antagonist in the comics, they have to, you know, try to play it at least like, you know, a role. Like it's supposed to kind of be a bit of a uh, uh, when it's revealed that. Loki is actually the son of the Frost Giant King, and that Odin I mean, just unless, took a baby. Odin in, unless just took he, a baby. Yeah, he just found him, and he was just lying there. And, and it's also like one of those <laughs> Free things baby. like, that is the mythology, and that mythology is not that obscure. Like, I don't know a lot of it, but I know enough to know, like, Loki is a, a trickster, and he becomes an antagonist to the Norse gods, and he's half Frost Giant. That's like one of the top three bulletin points. Yeah, it's and it's... Again, it's this this attempt to try to meld science and sort of the mythology of magic. Oh, what is – they keep that, doing that. They keep doing this science is magic, my, magic is science. It's all yeah. the same. I don't, I don't know why they felt like they needed to go there because it's very – it doesn't mean anything. You can, because, you can just have magic in these movies. We've got Doctor Strange coming a few years later. Well, because the first three movies of our mega franchise – have been focused on a weapons like engineer, a yeah, they've, they've been engineer sci-fi, and a yeah. scientist. So, for the sake of the theme, we need to have this be scientific based, is my guess. I, but we need to also be able to meld some of the high fantasy concepts. Which, if you're going to give me high fantasy, give me high fucking fantasy, not this like yeah, get me high and give weekday me on. So on sci-fi channel bullshit. It's you know what I think like, it is is it's like one of these things where it's like we can't be too quote unquote unrealistic. Like there's a lot of that for a while. Like um okay, so do you remember that Doom movie with uh with Carl Urban in The Rock from 2004? I didn't is- I didn't I never saw it, but I I know that there is a 
Doom movie with The Rock in it. You're not yes. missing much. It's sort of interesting. I mean, there's a couple parts of it that are sort of interesting, like a fun bad movie way. And it's sort of interesting that The Rock is the bad guy in that. He like turns evil at the end. Wait, he's the he's the bad guy. Yeah, he turns. He's the guy that turns evil what? at the end, and Carl Urban is the good guy. Damn. Um, but here's the thing: like Doom, the games, it, and they don't have a lot of plot. But in so much as they have a plot, it's a portal opens to hell, and you're fighting literal demons. Um, yes. In the movie, they felt like. It had to be science fiction. So it's a genetic something or other that like yeah. brings out your inner demon via science magic, which is like No, let it be Hellraiser, bitch. Yeah, Come why on. not? Why not? That's that's more like like the, the mix of like sci-fi soldier guys fighting Hellraiser stuff is more interesting aesthetically anyway. But Well, which is why I think Guillermo del Toro would have been like a really good guy to have adapted this material because yeah. he wouldn't have he wouldn't have tried to scientific he, the science. Well, I mean, he would have embraced the magic. It would have been a lot like Hellboy, probably right. Like yeah, and there probably been a lot more Hellboy, visual but... imagination and yeah. Um, Hellboy Hellboy one and two are a lot of fun, and there's a lot of great production design, a lot of practical stuff in them, uh, and even the stuff that's CGI. It's like the art directions on it is interesting, and they integrate it better you know like that's thing with cgi it's all about how you integrate it visually into everything else you're doing it's how it's composited yeah how it how how it melds with the it's of cgi don't get us wrong on this podcast we are not strictly at least said i'm i'm speaking for myself no i totally agree also speak for you but we are not strictly anti-cg we think cg is a good tool it is a tool and like any tool it should just be used as a tool, not as the entire kit and fucking caboodle. And it's, yeah, and it's the way they use it, which is very artless and... and Lifeless. Yeah. And smooth is the my favorite word used to describe it. Smooth. Smooth, yeah. And there's not, um, that's the thing, they don't, they don't composite it. They're not, like, like, the original, like, I always go back to the original Jurassic Park is it's like the, the way it works is it's like you have your close up of a mechanical T-Rex head. That is like really detailed. It's really there. It's got all that texture. But yeah, there's limitations how it can move and it's only a head. And then you cut away from that. You've got a whole T-Rex body that's CGI and it's like kind of hidden in rain and darkness. And you cut back to the head. And it's not just that shot on its own or the other shot on its own. It's the the conjunction of the two. Because that's what, I mean, you know this, but like I, for our audience, it's like move. It's it, a lot of people, way people talk about movies. It's just like this shot or that shot. It's the combination of shots it's 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 in the contrast and conjunction of cutting from one to the other that really makes a movie and whether it's emotionally or whether it's cutting from an animatronic to a cgi and back where both feel more real and really there because you're flipping between the two the animatronic makes this full cgi dinosaur more real the full cgi dinosaur makes the animatronic more real um like imagine how much more fun this movie could have been if there were even just a, a couple of practical like monster. If there was like if the robot at the end, even if the robot was fucking stop motion or something, that would have been cute. Oh, stop! I mean, you you and I would have loved it if it was stop motion, but your average movie goer would, would have it. would have just oh, they would fucking have hated, hated it. it because it's like they would not hated real, it. not modern. Um, but the, the end of this movie is also just so like lifeless and. You, when you when you messaged me like oh the robot fight and in the back of my mind I'm thinking like oh Jesus Christ he's still got like another 20 30 minutes of this movie to get through because that that robot giant robot that Loki sends down to New Mexico that's not the that's not the final no, climactic fight that's just <laughs> the how climactic fight is between well Loki that's and that's Thor, also where this movie is of. like ET where he he comes to earth and he meets people and then he dies and he comes back to life in a miracle and then he leaves in a rainbow. <laughs> he doesn't they, it's, they made Thor a little bit like die. Jesus. He kind of just falls over. Well he 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 it's 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 well, I mean it's one of those kind of implied like death, near death. And Ego, then like, yeah. Because he sacrificed himself, because he he was humble, he earned Mjolnir, and Mjolnir comes flying over and brings him back to life, and Natalie Portman thinks he's so hot and his goofy chainmail with his big Titty plates and and his bleached eyebrows and, and his bleached yeah, Thor, eyebrows and Thor his eyeliner. Learns to be Thor learns to be a leader by evacuating a small New Mexico town 
from a giant alien metal monster that his dickhead brother sent to Earth. Yeah, and, and be- then he yeah, tries he- to save everyone by fighting it as a mortal man. Yeah, he that's, that's he says, "I'm shit, I'm though. mortal now. I can't fight you, my friends. Fight the monster." And then after they, they lose, he tries to fight it anyway, even though he'll lose. So it's like, again, it's these things are happening because they've written what the character arc should be out on paper and they need something to do it. But it doesn't actually work like you don't but buy like, it. You're not invested. There are also so many obvious connections that this movie could have made. Like, for example, we were we were clowning about the Odin sleep thing. So why, like, he just has a heart attack out of nowhere, but why couldn't Odin have fallen ill or something or been injured as a direct consequence of, like, Thor's actions? Like, why couldn't, because again, we can't show Thor, like, hurting his dad even accidentally because we might not like him. So Odin just has to be angry at his son for invading the Frost world without his permission and then just is so emotionally distressed by his asshole sons that he just goes and, and was like, I'm going to Odin sleep now. It, it's it, they're just my, there's, my kids. There's so many. Yeah. My shithead kids have given me a migraine. I'm taking a my nap. Sh- <laughs> my shithead kids have t- given me a migraine. I'm taking a nap. That's the title of this episode. Um, um, Odin needs a Tylenol. <laughs> there we go. Odin, Odin, Odin needs needy a drinky. Tylenol. Oh, Odin, Odin needs his, like, 12 hours of sleep. But there there are just so many different ways you could have taken the story, and it just manages to take it in the most boring yeah, it's, direction it's, possible. They, and I they, think that's a big product of the direction, because Kenneth Branagh is... I, Sarah, I, I even mispronounced it this time, but... Um, we don't respect our, our him boy Kenneth, to pronounce it right. I yeah. Well, our our boy Kenneth is he's 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 not a very good director outside. He's not a good director outside of his niche in Shakespeare. I've, I don't know. If, I've only seen one of his Shakespeare adaptations. And that was in high school, so Neither I don't even I. know if they're actually any good. Neither uh, have I. But I'm. Just, I, I thought like, that Midsummer Night's Dream one. I think that was him. Was okay I, from what I remember in like grade eleven, ten. Uh, I guess he's. He's directed more, like, shitty stuff, and I think he's directed stuff that's memorable. What, what are his I other, like, <laughs> flops or turds? Uh, hold on. Give me one moment to bring that up. Uh, well, he, he we, we know he did the Artemis Fowl movie, which is widely, widely hated by everyone who's seen it. He also did... Uh, Murder on the Orient Express. He's doing Death on the Nile, the movie everyone's clowning. Oh, I saw the Gad trailer for about, that. <laughs> uh, where she's like, "I'm the champagne." It's like a Carnival Cruise commercial. It looked uh, uh, that's a that's a Perot <laughs> that character, right? Something I it looked guess, it looked weirdly like, like self serious for what seems like a kind of slightly tongue in cheek murder mystery sort of thing, where a guy has a goofy mustache. Uh, and they were playing it like real heavy drama, and that uh, that seems like a that seems like a miss for me, man. <laughs> yeah, well, a lot of a lot of people think uh, Kenneth should have had his director's license revoked with Artemis Fowl. Have you uh, seen that? No, but I Josh Gad is in it, and that's oh. all you need to know. That's I'm, all you need to I know. I did read those books. I'm kind of curious if it's like that bad. How bad it could I, be. Um, I I hear like Josh Gad eats another guy or something, and, and oh, it's he must be playing horrifyingly one of those dwarves rendered or, or something, or whatever they are. So yeah, I don't this the, the the movie just sounds totally obnoxious, and I just remember it being all over my timeline when it came out because it was terrible. So yeah, this which is which is very funny because Kenneth might win an Oscar this year has or at least has a very good chance of winning an Oscar with his very safe Oscar bait movie. I am a little British a, boy yeah. in Belfast. I am a little British boy. I just <laughs> please sir, oh, I just mommy. want I just want to kill all the Catholics. Oh mummy. Oh mummy. <laughs> <laughs> um this yeah, this what else can we talk about with this fucking movie? 
Um, like, there is just, another thing I caught when they're talking about, they, they refer a few times to like, oh, war is really bad. I know the terrible cost of war, but it's not really shown. The, I think the only thing that really suggests that is like Odin loses his eye, which he has to do because he's Odin. Uh, but he's, yeah, no, he, his thing. he's supposed to trade his, I mean, I guess, again, it doesn't really happen in mythology, but like, it's if I remember correctly, it's like Odin trades his eye, like a raven eats it, and that's like he gains some kind of wisdom or knowledge or foresight from that. I, you know, I picked up a lot of my mythology secondhand because I read Neil Gaiman's American Gods when I was like 14. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not familiar with any Greek mythology, never mind like the Thor canon so this this falls under things nicole does not really give two shits about uh but ragnarok like the like, actual like end of the world that some of that stuff's pretty cool there's a world serpent uh and it's gonna like fight a big wolf or something it's sick uh, well, it's Rag- pretty neat. the third ragnarok also has tessa thompson who's valkyrie and she's very very hot and she gets to do a lot of really cool shit so when we eventually get to Thor Ragnarok, I think hopefully we'll, we'll, I know we'll definitely enjoy it a lot better than this absolute slog that I, I really, I, we need to emphasize, I really can't believe Marvel released like three pretty much just shit movies back to back to back and still are in the position that they are in. Well, it's right now. Hulk, Hulk not with like an empire. Hulk not withstanding. It's the strength. But of this their, is just as bad. as Oh, it Hulk. is. No, no, no. But hear me out. It's Hulk not withstanding. It's the strength of their casting, and I think it's just that everybody oh, yeah. was so. And I remember even and I'm not that big a comic book, but even I was like conceptually hyped for the idea of Avengers just to see if they could do this thing where they like do like bring all these characters from all these different movies together into one movie and like do the comic book thing. Um. Back, back, you know, yeah, that was like, novel. and I remember thinking when they, because I, I actually I liked, like, here's one of my shams I'm going to have to reckon with when we do Avengers is, uh, I really like Joss Whedon stuff. Oh, um, and Shame. I remember when they, brought, no, it's okay. I've, I watched a bunch of Buffy, but I, I mean, there's right. a, there's a lot that you can say positively, I think about Buffy. Um, uh, and, uh, I remember being really, and I really loved Firefly because I mean I was I was like the teenager, right? And I like sci-fi and that kind of thing. Um, and so they said, oh, they got Joss Whedon to do the Avengers, and I mean, in a way, it was a good pick. I think there are certain things, and it's, it's not fun to say it because he's a really shitty guy, and he has there's a lot of things he's really <laughs> bad for, and has gotten worse yeah. for through his career as a writer. But he's good with an ensemble. Uh, I will say mm-hmm. that, like that's what kind of made Buffy work and Firefly work. Um, was was their casts. Well, and, funny and, you bring up and I thought Joss like Whedon too, but yes, finish that. Well, I was gonna say I was I was excited for Avengers because like oh they're gonna do all of these different characters they're gonna bring them all together for this big movie. I'm curious to see if they can pull it off if they can make that work. And they brought on Joss Whedon. It's like oh Joss Whedon can do that. He can do an ensemble cast. And I mean, for what I remember, Avengers like yeah. I mean we'll have a lot of bad to say about it. I'm sure, but it, like I give, given the fun. task, give yeah, and given the task at hand, given that you need to bring all those different characters together and make them all work in a two hour movie, like. It works, and it's. And I know our whole thing is to like criticize the MCU for what it represents for movies, but it's like these things are popular. There, there's there's some things that have made these movies popular for a reason. We gotta, I think, be forthright with that. Um, yeah, if we want to understand why they've come to rule culture with an iron uh, fist, um, with an Iron Man fist, with an Iron exactly. Man fist. Uh, uh, imagine Iron Man's boot stomping on a, a filmmaker's face for all of eternity. Yeah. But funny you bring up Joss Whedon because um, not only did Joss Whedon, he directed the end after end credits scene where Eric uh, uh, Stellan Skarsgård is approached by Nick Fury and it's it's set up for the Avengers where it reveals that, oh, Loki's not dead. He's actually inhabiting Stellan Skarsgård's body, I think. Right. You but know what? he, he I, directed uh, that sequence. I forgot there was an um, after credit sequence, uh, but yes. I did see it when the movie originally came out, and I do remember that. But uh, Joss Whedon directed that sequence, and during, just before they started actual production on Thor, 
they had already cast Chris Hemsworth, but Chris Hemsworth was filming Cabin in the Woods, which was directed by Joss Whedon no, at the time. Uh, he co-wrote and, it, uh, Drew Goddard. Oh, directed. okay. 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 But uh, Joss Whedon was on set and Chris Hemsworth was like talking to Joss Whedon. Joss Whedon was giving him advice on like how to play the character and how to approach the whole superhero role. So it's this, it's, it's also just very fascinating to see certain people and certain, I don't want to necessarily say creative influences because creativity is kind of a, a lacking uh, substance in these movies as we'll go along, but seeing certain actors show up like your your Joss Whedon eventually we're going to see the, you know the Russo brothers come into the fold and I'm sure how they got involved might may have been even with a movie before any of the Captain Americas like maybe they gave some sort of advice to someone or Kevin Feige at one point and Kevin Feige was like oh I remember this guy yeah, but it's uh, all nepotism these certain actors come in yeah networks well, yeah networking <laughs> so just just seeing these certain people that we now retroactively consider as being instrumental like architects to this cultural empire is quite fascinating like Joss Whedon comes in with Thor yeah that is so, that is weird because Cabin in the Woods was a weird case because the studio didn't like it and they put it on a shelf for years then then these movies start coming out and Chris Hemsworth becomes a star. Joss Whedon's name becomes worth more again. And then they rush and throw yeah. it back out when they're like, oh, shit, actually, a bunch of the, a bunch of people in this movie are kind people of like famous. Now. I, th- I think I rewatched that recently. I think it's it's Kevin Woods is pretty good. Um, uh, you know, not like the greatest movie ever made. I am a little like that kind of meta commentary thing is wears a little thinner on me now these days, but I think it, it works. I think it's, well, that's, that's also so much of our movies and culture now. Yeah. Like we're, we're living in the, me- how long do you think we're going to, before there's a Thor reboot, a Thor like, reboot, um, a, th- another, a Thor reboot. Oh man. Like the fourth movie hasn't even come out yet, but like 2029, 20, let's say. I mean, like, how long did they give Spider Man? Spider Man wasn't even like. Hold on, let me. Between Spider Man three and uh, Amazing Spider Man, so I, I want to say was two thousand seven years. Amazing Spider Man and Amazing Spider Man was two thousand twelve. That's. Five years. Five years. It's and then what was it? Amazing Spider Man to Homecoming was like three, right? Three or it was four. Was like well, Amazing Spider Man two was twenty fourteen, and Homecoming was twenty seventeen, twenty eighteen. I think so. Like three or four. So even a shorter time had elapsed. You know what they'll do? They won't fully reboot it. What they'll do is if they think it's getting old, but they don't want. The problem of a total reboot. They don't want to lose people invested in whatever came before. They'll do a soft reboot. They'll do the thing where it's like Chris Hemsworth hands the hammer off to another guy, or we find a oh, way well, to go I to a parallel dimension or, or some That's bullshit, what they're right? doing, I think. Yeah, but he's is, giving it to Natalie Portman. Oh, <laughs> she's, she's gonna, gonna be, Thor be the now, Thor? I think. Oh yeah. That's um I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I'm not against a girl Yay. Thor at all, in so much as I care about any of these things, but like Natalie Portman just doesn't seem like an actress that can carry that kind she's of role to me at all. She's not an action hero. Not even she's remotely. A, I think she's a great actress, actress, but she's not an action hero. I, I don't know if I've really like, like been particularly impressed by her in anything, but I haven't seen Black Swan in a long time, so I might have to rewatch. I remember Myla Kunis making more of an impression on me in Black Swan. Uh, I mean, the professional, that was her, her like, big oh, yeah. role. Oh, oh, do you know the lore on that movie? Oh, yeah, I do. That, oh, <laughs> I remember yeah. I remember watching that movie. I think I saw I it I feel kind of bad that I have it on DVD. I mean, it's 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 still fine it's to like movie. a movie. I mean, I think we all like Rosemary's Baby. <laughs> we know what Roman Polanski is. We, we like Rose, yeah. Um, but I, re- I remember. We're allowed. We're allowed one. I, I remember one. watching... Uh, I, I think I saw The Professional as a kid at one point. Cause it was one of those things where you watch a movie and it all feels kind of familiar. And I remember watching it as a teenager and thinking, 
is is Natalie Portman supposed to look hot? And then she's like 12. Is she supposed to look hot? Is she supposed to have a thing with Sean? And I thought, no, you know, it's a French, it's a French director. He's just being artistic. I'm just reading too much into this stuff. I'm no. just sexualizing because I'm neurotic about. No, French perverts. No, it's just a huge All French pervert. are perverts. They are. <laughs> Um, All French people there, are perverts. The, in early in earlier draft of that screenplay, um, uh, Natalie Portman and Jean Reno outright explicitly fuck. Yeah, in that movie. Uh, yeah, that's, that's just yeah crazy. Um, they were like, you can't, you can't do that. It also no. puts Fifth <laughs> Element into a different perspective because uh, Mila Jovovich and that is like a like a child woman. Oh yeah. Oh, now that's I haven't. Again, Watch another another movie I, I really adore, Fifth Element. I saw it at a formative age. It's got a lot of imaginative stuff. And although a lot of it's probably like cribbed from Mobius or something, like there's kind of a look that French sci-fi can have. Well, they had the costumes were designed by Jean-Paul Gaultier, which are amazing. Like fucking uh oh, what's his what's his name? People thought he was on Epstein's uh Chris plane. Tucker. Chris Tucker. He was. Uh, no, no. I, I thought it turned and, out that really that was movie? that Chris Tucker. Oh, that's a... Wait, it really was? I think it was. Aww. Boo. I mean, it, Boo. you know what? We are an anti-pedophilia podcast. It might have... I mean, if it's only once, I don't know for sure. Like, like, oh, like Chris Matt Groening flew on his jet, but apparently he just got his, like, a foot massage. Yeah. No, he got a foot massage. And he, I, I, I brought that up. I, in when I reviewed the uh, Dasha movie. Yeah, that's... People uh, needed to know that. But I, I could see, like, you're just like... Because, I mean, the, the, Epstein and Ghislaine were just, like, massive star fuckers. So I could see you, like, just getting this guy being like, hey, let's party, blah, blah, blah. And then you show up and it's all weird. So I don't... You know, if, you're, if they're on there more than once, uh, for sure, 100%. But if they're only on there once maybe it was just like a, oh that was weird i'm just never going to talk to this guy again uh, maybe <laughs> we need to censor this uh I, I allegedly blah 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 <laughs> well you know what galane's Your call <laughs> galane's in jail and and uh epstein's uh uh, De- uh quote unquote dead. committed suicide yeah <laughs> um let's i i can think of something else we can talk about with thor <laughs> Um, S.H.I.E.L.D.? Because S.H.I.E.L.D.'s position in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, as it's been established so far, they aren't really coming off as people we would want to side with or want our heroes Even, to side well, with. Well, they're, they're the government in E.T. in this. They're the government in E.T. They take all of Jane's research under the guise that it is a security threat. Um, a guy at the diner outright refers to them as the feds uh stone skarsgård also mentions bruce banner and how he disappeared as well because i guess yeah. you know, the scientific community talks <laughs> to each other so are we supposed to think shield are the good guys like I, but they, they operate no different than feds if civilian opinion is to be believed they, in this they don't know they have no idea they, they don't know what shield is for or what it does. I think there was some interest in like the idea of Shield being kind of like an ambivalent entity. Like they go there with with Winter Soldier, um, kind of. But I, I think maybe they were interested in this idea of Shield being like uh, uh, this big entity that brings the characters together and moves the plot forward and it basically has good people in it, but has elements that you, you don't always know if you can trust. And you can wring dramatic tension out of that. But but they they aren't good at it. like Shield in these no. early movies is always no. just kind of they they show up and they make the plot happen, but nothing they're doing makes sense. Like what are they doing with Thor's hammer? They set up like this lab around it, <laughs> but like what are they doing? And why they're they're yeah they're they're not doing it's anything not like and then it's, and then it's like oh well we'll let Thor try and pick up the hammer and and fail and like they're it's it's not I think what they do is they rely they, they fall back on this idea like oh Nick Fury has some kind of master plan to bring everything together and you just trust that's the case and so that just lets them do whatever they think will make the plot move and you don't have to worry about if it makes any sense or if they have a, a discernible objective at all which yeah. they which they don't it's it's just hacky writing um to make things happen when you want them to happen and contrive guys for thor to fight without superpowers um and i don't um they're they're like the men in black basically like it's, it's yeah they're, they're they guys in black 
suits trying to keep a world conspiracy under wraps. Like by this, when we get to Captain America, Captain America establishes that like Captain America was created by Shield's predecessing organization, uh, the name of which escapes me right now. But the origins of Shield go all the way back to just after World War II. So, and of course, they they get into sort of that. Uh oh, the Nazis infiltrated Shield years ago. When we get to Captain America Two, which I guess lizard brain people can maybe go back and and be like, well, they were look. You can explain their fed like behavior by the fact that they had Nazi suits in them the whole time, which I did. I am lizard brained enough to notice um, the character. Uh, and I can't believe I remember his name. Uh, Jasper Sitwell. Uh, he's the bald guy. He's the bald guy with the glasses. And oh. he's a suit at, who's a suit at shield. He is revealed in Captain America 2 to be one of the main like Hydra uh, infiltrators into in, into shield. Oh, like he, he, okay. he famously he famously leans into the guy and goes, hail Hydra. Um, and that's that's his claim to fame. So he's he's introduced in this movie just to to help poke Thor's hammer with a bunch of other stupid scientists. Like, uh, what they I mean, can't I, lift Thor's hammer, but they're taking like radioactive energy. Readings I mean, off. like what one of the, the only bits on? of of horniness we get in uh, this movie because they're thinning it out. They're thinning it out as they go. The horniness. One of the only bits of horniness we get in this movie is Chris Hemsworth topless, and I feel like uh, a lot he of takes people want to poke his hammer, or they want to be poked <laughs> by his hammer. Well, we're, I'm, we've already established that I am a Chris Evans girl. I'm in the, 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 you got your, your, your Chris Evans, your Chris Hemsworth. Uh, nobody, nobody likes, uh, uh, Chris Pratt right now. He sucks. Um, and then Chris Pine is in the DCU I am, movies, I'm so but he's also him. one of the Chris's. Uh, but I, I like to think Chris Hemsworth and Chris, I, I mean, Chris Hemsworth and Chris Evans are the superior Chris is over Chris Pratt, Pratt, undoubtedly. Chris Pratt is, I'm so sick of it. I remember finding him endearing on Parks and Rec, which is a show that I oh, got. Oh, he's funny, isn't I he? got sick of the further it went on, but like it was fine enough when it when I first started watching it for what it was. But uh, he, it's just, well, I mean, I think it's like he got fit and. He got uh, full of himself. Yeah, well, I, I, I don't know how true this is, but apparently he was like a, a definite like jock high school bully type guy. That and like, I think me. the farther he goes on and the less he's playing like a, a chubby, goofy guy, the more that comes out. Like on some level, you start to pick up on it. Like, oh, this this guy's kind of a dickhead. And I, I think it starts to bleed through. But I'm I'm really sick of Chris Pratt at this point. And it's no not one's... just because of he's in a, a, a reactionary right wing sex cult Christian church that was founded by a pedophile. Um, or that he's playing Mario and that he's what, not Italian. What is that? What, what the fuck any, is that? Like that any that, day now that trailer is going to drop. That is that is the I most think. cast by an algorithm I've ever seen. Like they just had a computer <laughs> figure out who's Chris gonna Pratt. be in that movie. He is so cool. <laughs> um fucking Miyamoto. But it's because he's in the Lego movie, that's why. Yeah, it's because he's in the Lego movie. It's because he's That's also why Charlie Day is gonna be that's also what Charlie Day is going to be in it because that's, that's okay. But template. I do like Charlie Day as Luigi. That I I can see that. That's I mean, which, which begs why wasn't why wasn't I think they should our, have Italian boy, accents even if they're broad. Why wasn't our boy accents. Danny DeVito cast as Mario? It's this got, been the it's got too Mario. much integrity. Too much integrity. I mean, I don't, um, I've seen him in some <laughs> ads for things, so I don't know if actually. But um, you know what though? Like, wh- where's John Leguizamo? Bring him back. Let him be Luigi again. Let him take another bite at the apple. He can be good. He was, I did a couple months ago, I watched the Super Mario Brothers movie because my roommate really likes it, like, likes it so much they can, like, while we were watching it, they were like, who, sorry, you cut out, who word for it? word, <laughs> what, what? Who likes it so much? You cut out. My roommate. Oh. <laughs> my roommate. And they were just like line for line. Like, it, it's as if they had had the whole script fucking memorized. Like, they had seen it that many times. It's. But that, like, that movie has so much more charm than fucking Thor. It, it is. Thor is just so lifeless and charmless. It's, well, um, Super Mario Brothers, the, the 93 movie, is like the kind of kind of Hollywood 
mid to high budget movie you don't really get anymore. Like, who was it saying? They're like, all movie, gone. Who is it that was originally said like movies aren't allowed to be bad anymore? I don't know, but I, I, agree. I think I think Viperwave might have said that, but I don't know if they originated. Rocky it. shout out. Yeah, but um, it's it's it is like everything's kind of smooth. Like 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 it's rare something's really like embarrassingly bad or, or out there or weird. It's just varying degrees of 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 tedious mediocrity and that 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 grav that and that's one of the things i want to talk about as we go on is the mar as the mcu really becomes what it is now is that everything is that compression towards a mean towards like a consistent adequacy like a mcdonald's hamburger um but that mario brothers movie is i maybe we should do like a watch something else on that one because it's not good yeah but it's fascinating because it's weird and it's trying all these different things. It's got crazy production design. It's such a weird, yeah. Cause the, at the time, like the Mario world was just these handful of 2d games. So they're, they're, they're doing such weird stuff to try and extrapolate a world and plot from what's, what's in the, any, yeah. the original Nintendo Mario games. Like it's, it's fascinating. And it is, even though it's not good, it's, it is charming and endearing because it is trying all these, all these things that's so out there. And there is like a restored, not really a director's cut, but like a a, a restoration of an earlier oh, version of the film. Yes, yes. I, I have that this. when when I get back home because right now, for our listeners, I'm uh, attending to some family related stuff. I'm not at at home where I normally live. Um, when I get home, I have it on my computer. I've got a link to it somewhere if I can dig it up, and I'll see if I can get it to you. And maybe we should. Yes, thank you. Get to that sometimes. I think that would be pretty interesting. Live live stream for the people, us watching the extended cut of the Mario. Actually, Brothers that's movie. a good question. Would you get in copyright trouble over that? Does anyone care? I probably not. Probably not, especially while Nintendo's kind of like buried any association with this movie that they may have. They're you know what? If putting all their focus on the Illuminati. If it's on YouTube, atrocity. it's probably a safe bet. Although I don't know if that cut will be on youtube you know Al, when i get home i will look into it maybe we'll do a live watch that could be pretty fun all right um, so we're, so is is your watch something else for this episode because we're fucking done talking oh yeah yeah, yeah. we can we can fucking we can come to a Thor. conclusion um watch yeah definitely watch something else so would your watch something else is probably the super mario brothers movie uh no no you know what i have okay. i i hadn't thought about it but uh, something immediately came to mind when you when we were talking originally. And you said that this Thor needs to be more heavy metal. I have a I have a I have a notion. Um, but what's your watch? Something else. Mine. Um, well, because the 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 angle of this movie is alien fish out of water water story. So I have two. Um, first being the man who fell to Earth, starring uh, the great David Bowie, who I I miss dearly. Every day, that is a certified classic, and he's also super hot in that movie. And the other is Under the Skin, starring uh, Oh, I Scarlett love Hansen. Under the Skin. Well, because that is also a fish out of water story about an alien trying to be a human, and more specifically, trying to be a human woman. Under so yeah, Under the Skin yeah. rules. I love that movie. I would rewatch it. I've never seen. Uh, I've never seen The Man Who Fell to Earth. I haven't seen it in a long time, but is it? It's at the in terms of a good fish out of water sort of like alien coming to humanity and learning a bit from humans. You can't really do anything more on brand for me. So hence, I'm I am recommending both of those movies. Um, especially under the skin because that is Scarlett Johansson does play. Black Widow. So there's your direct connection in case you and she is Marvel headed ple- people all the really way needed. naked in that movie. She's which she's which I thought pretty in this I thought movie. I thought well, I just, like it's just genuinely astonishing like someone that like like actors that at that level of like stardom with big roles like that they don't normally go there you know they yeah they normally... have no nudity clauses and she is and often. I mean I th- it's it's because I think it's just, it's such a good movie it was worth it and it's it's it's, it's and I mean, I'm not against sleazy exploitative of nudity, but it's not in this this movie. Like, it, it's probably like a worth it thing. But like, I was shocked when I watched it. And it's, she's not even like airbrushed or anything. There's dimples no. and divots and a little bit of cellulite. It was like, wow, she. Uh, I, I respect her a lot for that. That was a pretty bold That's move to make for someone body. who. Yeah, that, that was a pretty bold move to make for someone that had just been in the fucking Avengers pretty recently when that came out. 
Um, Which begs the question, this movie, Thor would have been greatly improved if Chris Hemsworth got his dick out, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. I know you're, you're a fan of, of, you know, actually, I kind of want to ask, full frontal. I kind of want to ask you this. I've always kind of gone back and forth on this. Like, do, like, is, is it like a, a comedic thing or do the women actually enjoy seeing penises, broadly speaking? Yes. Women that are attracted well, to Well, me, partly eight, because it, again, we have to see like women's tits in movies all the time. I mean, not so much nowadays because. A lot of movies have been completely sanitized of any sexuality whatsoever. But I I watch a lot of, like, garbage. So I watch a lot of crappy B-movies. So in crappy B-movies, they're like, we need to have nudity. Let's have a lady take her shirt off. So it's just very nice to see that sort of gender equality. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah, I I like like to, yeah, men need to, men have goods. Let them show it. I, ag- so I agree. I'm, I'm full free, free the dick. Um, I'm going to burn my tidy whities and go on a march. <laughs> um, I uh, okay, right. My my watch something else. So I was thinking, what's more heavy metal than 1981's heavy metal? The the yeah. animated anthology. I haven't film. seen it yet, but I know I'd really speaking dig it. speaking of dicks and titties, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, there, I know there are titties in that movie, but are there dicks? I think so. I think there are. Oh, yeah. hell yeah. But there's titties, there's bush, there's... um, Hell yeah. Like, there's... I mean, I, I mean, it is... It's uh, It's not... I mean, it, it's sleazy, it's hard rock, it's based on stuff that was in Heavy Metal Magazine. It's um, very... Like, it was relatively... Like, it was like a kind of independent production, but they're doing everything they can with that budget for the animation. It, it's cha- every vignette's different. Um, they're all very, you know, everything's a little bit juvenile, but it's all very in, in, engaging and and fun and yeah, violent and horny uh, in a way nothing is now. And it's like it's an example of what you can do if you're going to do like this cosmic sci-fi magic stuff, fantasy mishmash. Heavy metals got that. Um, yeah, like that's do, the kind of like, like that. <laughs> imaginative, fun out there stuff you could do um, if you're going to do that like sci fantasy cosmic thing. Um, plus, it's got a banging soundtrack. The, the music isn't really heavy metal by any modern standard. It's more like hard rock. But like, damn, they got Veteran of the Psychic Wars in there, which is one of my favorite songs. Um, just. Uh, um, there's this, this great sequence where there's like, um, this guy is in like a world war two bomber over the Pacific and he gets shot up and the rest of his crew are dead, but then they start coming back to life as zombies. Uh, heavy metal rules. It's a lot of fun. Just get yourself nice and, and, uh, uh, you know, smoke a big fat blunt and watch some heavy metal. Nice. It's like, it's every, it's, it's everything Marvel movies yeah. aren't. Like, I think to, to, to cap this off. What if I haven't stressed it enough? I really want to stress it here before we go. But like, Thor feels like an intellectual property that is ripe for so much creativity, and it's just kind of astounding that they fucked it up twice. Like, it took until the third movie, and what what movie in a trilogy? Like, when is the third movie in a trilogy ever considered the best one? Oh, that's a really like, good question. Can you think of any other examples? I can't right now. There, honestly. there are there are some wild ass contrarians that will say that about Alien. That's about the only one that comes to. Oh mind. yeah, well they're they're yeah, wrong. There are but... a lot of a- Alien Three <laughs> diehards. I, but, I still need um, to see the assembly cut. I haven't seen Alien Three in a long time. Um, I, I think it's got redeeming qualities for sure. Um, but I don't David think Fincher doesn't even like it. No. he made it. Well, he doesn't it's like, like it. I don't I think want to talk in about part this because the experience of making it was so horrible. That the story, the Alien Three, like I. Um, Shout out to Donna on Twitter. Uh, I, I don't know what her handle is right now. Oh, uh, hi, Donna. But uh, she is like, I mean, she's got that thing where it's like you just like mention one of her five mega interests and she will just send you pages and pages of, of stuff. But like she just knows every single thing about Alien 3. She's read every single <laughs> pre-production screenplay and, and it, it rules. It's one of my, that is one of my favorite like fucked up production stories of alien three all the crazy but, like, shit they even, <laughs> even just just trying to think of like 
like, what if Thor looked like Mandy? For ex- like the movie Mandy. I, uh, what I if it had that sort Mandy. of like colorful? Oh, it's it's on my a, list. There's another recommendation in terms of um, and I'm I'm connecting this to Thor because the whole movie's aesthetic is just heavy metal as fuck, and this is what a Thor movie should be. It should really lean into the kitschy heavy metal sort of angle that Thor really lends itself to. I mean, and it makes what, sense. And that's what Mandy does. Hitting people Mandy's with great. a big hammer. You might as well go for broke. Um, well, well Nicholas Cage has a s- chainsaw fight in Mandy. That is so much cooler than a stupid fucking flying hammer. And that should, that should just make you want to watch this. Yeah. Right like now. why isn't there a guy with a big chainsaw for Thor to, th- Thor to fight? That would be cool. But yeah, like that's, that's, I mean, that's the thing. This whole movie, it's too, it, it, it's, it, it, it won't take any risks. It's trying to do too many things at once, but all the things it wants to do are boring. Um, it's way too austere and lacking in texture. Um, as and I think that's going to be a uh, it's going to be a thing we'll have to say about a lot of these movies going forward. That's going to yeah. be a, a recurring well, motif. I'm I'm still. Our, well, our, our our next episode, presumably, we're I'm still holding out for Captain America movie. I'm still I'm I'm still. The part of me that that's still not a cynical, hardened bitch is still holding out that that will still hold up upon rewatch. But we we will see. We'll see. I mean, if you're <laughs> if you're bitter and disappointed, that might make for some great cut. But I have a I have an idea. If you're interested, if okay. you've got the time. Um. So Joe Johnston, who directed that, he got that job. I'm like 100 percent sure because of this because, because of the rocket the rocket year, which I I remember seeing when I was a little kid. And I, I want to watch that ahead I, of time. I don't remember a lot of, yeah, I was going to say we should watch that because I don't remember a lot about it, but I remember liking it a lot as a little, little, little kid in like the early mid nineties. I, I was seen on tape or TV and I've always been kind of curious to go back and revisit, but I've never gotten around to it. So I thought that might be, cause it's also like retro futuristic yeah. back to the world war two era. Um, yeah. And then, uh, oh yeah, there's also sky captain in the world of tomorrow. If anyone remembers that movie. <laughs> Oh, that was An- Angelina Jolie had an eye patch, I think. Oh yeah, I forgot she was in that. Yeah, it's because uh, she she's just in it for like one or two scenes, but it's like Jude Law. And- <laughs> she, she was she was in all the marketing material for that movie, if I remember correctly. Why is she? Damn. She's like yeah, barely prominently, in it. and she's barely in the movie. God damn! It's it's Jude Law. Movies are and, ripoffs. Um, it's Jude Law and uh, and uh, who was that in that now? Oh, that's going to drive me crazy. I'm, I'm just, I have to look it up now. Um, this is probably the first time anyone's thought about Sky, Sky Captain, Captain in the world, world of, tomorrow. of tomorrow for the past two years. The, the past 20? Almost, when did 20? it come out? Like 2004? That's, that's one of those movies that was like shot entirely on green screen as like a deliberate choice. Oh, Gwyneth Paltrow. Yeah. Speaking of Iron Man. Oh, Pepper. girl, Our, our favorite girl boss. Yeah. Pepper Potts. It, damn, doesn't it? It kind of kind of feel bad that I'm I'm kind of missing Tony Stark right now after Thor because at least there's there's as as noxious as those Iron Man movies are. Robert Downey Jr. just has an infectious charm that I mean he is he's so easy to watch. He's just one of those guys. Um, yeah, he's easy to watch. Um, not that Chris Hemsworth. Chris, we we think Chris Hemsworth makes a good Thor. It's just they. Don't they don't know, know what, what to do, to with, do Thor. with Thor? What's you know? Here's like, the thing: Is Hemsworth the first of our like outrageously ripped steroid case Marvel guys? Um, because like Ed Ed Norton's the, no, it doesn't need to be. He's, he's he's not especially buff in Hulk. Maybe, uh, Robert Downey maybe, Jr.'s I'll, in decent and obviously he's in pretty good shape, but he's not like crazy I mean, buff or anything. I'm I'm sure I'll dig into my um, Captain America like knowledge when we when we do that episode about you'll like, you'll you'll whether, dig it you'll dig I mean, into your Chris, folder marked taxes um my, my folder <laughs> marked taxes i open it up and just pictures of chris evans shirtless spell out and i'm like no no th- this is my w2s no don't look at them uh, oh uh, those like you ever see those you've got you've got like the fake dudes or his head's been photoshopped on like a guy no <laughs> no no, those are yeah. But th- <laughs> they make those. Uh, they make those of like every Marvel guy now. Oh, do they? They, they, they actually make do, those yeah. of men. I've only seen the ones of women. Yeah, 
Because oh, I've, yeah. I've gone to see like an actress. Oh, like, I'm oh, positive. For, like an actual new scene of an there actress. Are gay and then I see all the fake too. ones. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I, was, I don't gay always know if they. Look at that. I don't know if they get horny in the same, like just abjectly pathetic way straight men do. <laughs> that's my uh, thing. Well, every, every everyone gets pathetically horny, but. Yeah. This, you know what? You know what? This movie didn't make me feel anything. That's that's our episode on Thor, everybody. That's our episode on please, Thor. It's uh, please watch something else. It's no lightning, no thunder. <laughs> no lightning, no thunder. Uh, Chris Hemsworth's eyebrows are are terribly bleached. Uh, this this yeah, I I really can't believe they built a media empire off of one all right movie in just three turds. Yeah, that's I think that's why we spent like, so much time talking about other. Other movies. Other, it's we, like, hey, remember Sky Captain? <laughs> <laughs> like maybe if if we broke this episode down, we maybe talked about Thor for maybe like sixty percent of the time. We were just like, oh, what about this? And we just went on tangents, which is which is just a testament to how forgettable and boring and bad this movie is. Well, that's uh, so. Well, that's yeah, this was this is too. Two bad movies stitched together into a worse movie. So we've got kind of two podcasts. One about Thor, one about uh, Dongs. And um, how we need more sex and the, violence in movies. And the 1993 what, Super Mario Brothers movie. And 1993 Super Mario Brothers movie. All right. Well, I, I guess we'll, we'll we'll end our Marvel talk here. Yeah. Thank you again for listening, everyone. Um, if if you're feeling generous, you know, give us positive reviews on your preferred podcast site. Do you know, like and share and just pester everybody and get them to listen to our show. And tell, tell your friends, tell your family, tell your uh, boss, tell your co-workers, tell your greatest enemies how we want them to listen to us, especially if they... You know, if, you, if you've got a relative, no people. if you've got a relative that's slipping into senility, so, so <laughs> take their device, subscribe to our podcast on it, and they can just listen to the same episodes over and over and over because they don't remember listening to them, and that'll really rack up uh, the numbers. It'll be the, the last thing a dying person hears is is my fucking bird voice shrilly talking in their ear. I love that. Just slipping, slipping away into in, 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 into, into the void. All right, good night, everybody. Good night.